It was an upsetting story. It was about Thursday in Gaza. There had been an Israeli attack in Khan Yunus, and at least 27 people had been killed, including a mother and her four, four children who had been, as the story said, incinerated in their tent. And the story went on to say that now the count was around 39,667 people who have been, whose bodies have been recovered. But the part that really upset me was not the almost 40,000, but the mother and her four children. That's how our brains really just work. There's a term for that a concept called psychic numbing. Um, Paul Slovic, who teaches at University of Oregon, has studied genocide and famine and disaster and how we respond or don't respond. And he says, you know, our lack of response is not just that we're heartless and callous. There are reasons, there are reasons why nations don't really respond, right, to genocide because it's dangerous, it's difficult, it's costly, it's risky. And then there are reasons that we don't really respond as the numbers escalate. And one of those is this somewhat familiar idea of psychic numbing, like as numbers escalate, our feelings don't escalate. In fact, sometimes our feelings actually decrease. So if I say, you know, hey, there's a little child and a little, she's maybe seven, and now there's a, you know, camera on her and she's floating off the coast of Greece. You know, she's a refugee. Somehow she got separated from the boat. She's just out there on this tiny piece of plywood. I mean, our hearts break for her and the rescue operation. But then if you hear, well, there's actually two little ones. You're more concerned, but you're not twice as concerned, right? And three and four. And then by the time you go from there's 87 children to 88, you just don't really have much difference between how you feel about 87 or 88, right? So if I say, you know, there's 600,000 people right now at risk of famine in the Sudan. Actually, it's 700,000. I mean, we don't feel any different between 600 and 700,000, right? It's just we can't really comprehend that. It's just our, our emotions just don't work that way. But there's something else he writes about that I think is less explored and really helpful, and it's what he calls pseudo ineffectacy. <laughs> Am I saying it right? It means like we have a false sense of our own ineffectiveness. We have a false sense of our powerlessness. So we don't act sometimes when we can act because we're overwhelmed by the numbers. So a simple little study kind of shows this. They did like a study of college kids in Sweden. They showed them a picture of a little girl. They said, hey, would you contribute this little girl is at risk of starvation? You know, a lot of the college kids, yeah, I'll help. Then they showed them the same picture of the little girl, exact same picture, she's at risk of starvation, and then next to it a slide, she's one of millions who are at risk. How many people will contribute? I mean, a smaller number. You know, at first they thought, well, more people, because wow, you can see how big the problem is. But what scholars talk about is that when we help someone, we have this warm glow feeling, right? You help people, to be honest, we all, I mean, because we feel good, right? We, you know, we know we benefit people. And, but when you see the needs are so freaking massive, then you have this negative feeling of helplessness. And so what happens is the negative feeling sort of overwhelms the warm glow. And this happens even when you go from one child to two. So they showed a picture of two children. Would you help you know, one of these two children? And even then the needs, the numbers go down. We're not the very first people to struggle with this, right? That's what we're hearing about in the scriptures. You have the disciples, they have been out teaching and healing and doing all the things. We are told they've already touched many people. They've anointed many and they've cured many. They've, they've cast out many demons. And then, you know, they give Jesus a report and they get a promotion, right? They're called apostle now, but they're also tired. Now they're tired. And they're tired because there are many people still coming. The Greek word many shows up six times in the next six sentences, right? There are many people, there's a line, there's a throng, there's many, 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 many. There's so many, so many people don't have a chance to eat, right? I mean, people are exhausted. And so Jesus tells them, and we've already heard this many, right? Before we've heard this is a theme in Mark's gospel. Remember back in chapter two when they were carrying the paralytic, but there were so many people they couldn't get there and they had to climb up on the roof. So there's a lot of people with a lot of need. So Jesus tells them, this is what you gotta do. You gotta come away to a private place or come away by yourselves to a deserted place. And you know, when the gospel repeats something, we know we're supposed to step up. So then it's repeated again. And they came away to a deserted place privately by themselves. So the point is, you all really need to rest, right? But the deserted place would have triggered something else. That's the wilderness. So it would have been a reminder that the wilderness, where people are wandering, where people are needy, where the, you know, wandering in the wilderness, 
you know, even when you go to this deserted place, even when you go on vacation, even when you're on the retreat, you can't get too far away from the wilderness. You can't get too away from all the needs. No doubt, because the people in the scripture have seen where they're going, and before they can even get there, the people are already there asking for more help, right? They're already there. Blah, 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 need help me, help me, help me. So the disciples, who, as we know, don't always look great in Mark's gospel, and Brad's going to teach about that in a few weeks, the disciples here really shine. The disciples just keep their rear end in the boat, right? Jesus sees that they're tired. You know, they've got their own compassion fade, compassion collapse, whatever you want to call it. And Jesus gets out. Jesus has compassion on the people. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus gets out and teaches all these people. But the, but the disciples just stay in the boat. I think there's a lesson in there, right, about balance. We talked about the boat a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember we talked about um, how the land and the scripture is always a, it's always a sign of promise and possibility and this safety and, you know, the place where you can, where you go when you want to be with a friend or someone that's just place of respite. And the sea in the scripture is always this place of chaos and challenge. And, and the boat is a way of extending the land. And we talked a couple of weeks about, you remember, about how we are all called to kind of extend with the boat. We're just to be the boat. We offer to one another. We offer care. Except for sometimes, no, sometimes you just need to stay in the boat, right? It kind of is a balance. I think the Sunday after Michael's, Micah's funeral, I think I talked about this. My friend Cindy said she always looks at the congregation kind of, or looks at the world, kind of divides it in two. There are people who are just barely hanging on, just barely, because they've buried their child or they're struggling, they've lost their job, there's mental illness, there's challenges. And all of those people are like looking for a sign, looking for something to keep going. The rest of us who are in a good spot, we're supposed to be kind of looking for the way that we can reach out and care and offer. So it's kind of a balance. Sometimes you're in the boat, sometimes you're not. But the reality is, eventually what happens disciples get out of the boat and help too, right? They get back out of the boat because now there's 5,000 people and nobody remembered to bring their lunch. They don't have anything to eat because they weren't thinking. And so they jump out there. And then the rest of chapter 6 is just a litany of many, 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 many things. So what do we do in this kind of a situation where, you know, it's easy to feel really overwhelmed? And Slovak comes up with a couple of ideas which I don't know that are really tested, but seem to be, make a lot of sense. One of them is share your story, right? Like when you, when you know someone's story, then, you know, because there's that line, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. I mean, when you know people's story, you get to know someone like Jennifer does from the Ukraine, or you work with people who live on the street, or you work with refugees, or you work with people who are, you know, coming out of a cancer situation, then you feel a sense of connection. You feel a sense of, you know, I want to care because now I understand. Kind of like the reason we're being the, you know, part of the reason we're bringing the refugee family here from Venezuela. It's not just because, you know, there's 67 million refugees and we're going to help one. It's also because we're going to be changed and transformed by their individual story. But then the second thing he says, which I think is kind of interesting, he's kind of riffing off that work of the economist Danny Kahneman on slow and fast thinking. We've talked about that before. Remember, like you get your slow thinking going which is when you meet somebody and you're falling in love and you're just drinking them up and you just like every single thing and you're just, your brain is just lit up, right? Or when you're trying to learn to do something for the first time, like riding a bike, that's the expensive part of your brain. But then after you learn those things, after you, then you put people on autopilot, right? You quit listening to them. It's that fast, cheap part of your brain. So what he says here is that we kind of need to do that when we look at challenges too. We need to engage that slow part of our brain. So an example would be harvesters right here in our own city. 45 bucks a month is what it costs to feed somebody, feed a kid. 45 bucks a month, you could feed a kid, which means a kid is going to start school, they're going to have enough to eat, which means they're going to be able to think and grow and thrive. And that's not a hard thing to do. And that's kind of what harvesters encourages people to do because they help people at every single food bank. If you enter your zip code, so many things are going to pop up. But then when you dig into the Harvester's website, and you see that there's, in our 27-county area, 109,000 kids at risk of food insecurity. And you think, well, what can my help in what, you know what, it's still one kid, right? You're still helping one kid, and that's the, that's the kind of engaging your brain to kind of help you think about it. And then his last thing is like collaborate, like let's work together. If, if a lot of us pitch in the 45 bucks, or a lot of us pitch in a little bit of it, it'll make a difference. 
Well, what I've been thinking about too is how the reason that we struggle to care is not just because there's so many problems out there, but because we've all got our own stuff. We've all got our own many, 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 many things. So one of my very dearest friends is uh, kind of like the backbone of her community with her spouse, and they are just out there doing all kinds of stuff. And she has this remarkable sense of balance. I do not know anybody with a stronger sense of balance. She's got a really rich prayer life, a rich journaling life. She's a walker. She's just built kind of, she's kind of built this world of a retreat. And they have had more issues the last 15 years than like anybody I know. They've had cancer, they've had mental illness, they've had um, addiction, they've had, and, and, and she's just kept going until a month ago. Until a month ago, when she had this situation where someone in her immediate family just tore her up and down, inside and out. I mean, you know when people say things to one another? I don't know if you've ever had that, like just in, where you think, there's no taking that back, right? I mean, there's certain things you can say to somebody that are really, really, really hard to walk back. I mean, really hard. And she was pretty devastated. So she <coughs> called her therapist. She had a meeting with a therapist. And the first thing the therapist told her was, don't do anything for two weeks. Slow down. I thought that was interesting because I'm all over that Stan Kat Tatkin kind of wired for love who's all about couples and when there's a breach, you want to jump in there and fix it. Which I think it's probably true with couples. It doesn't matter whose fault it was. Let's just try to solve it. But maybe when it's a parent and child, nobody's going anywhere, right? You can't get rid of one another. What's two damn weeks, right? So the whole point was slow down and think and just kind of give yourself some breath, think about it. But then when she talked to the therapist two weeks later, she had her... 99 concerns that she was planning to share with this family member. She has a lot of concerns. And the therapist said, no, nope, you share one thing. Not 99, one thing. I was uncomfortable about, and I'm sorry I was not more clear about that. You know, it's like one thing, which then again makes you stop and put your brain, your good expensive brain on and think, what am I really concerned about here? What is really bothering me? What is it that's really, dig which there's something about that that's super helpful because I've been thinking again back to our own congregation. Last week, we had three young men in our church behind bars. I mean, there's a lot of, people are carrying a lot of stuff. People are carrying a lot of stuff. There's so many challenges and the resources in our country have sort of shrunk to deal with those. But when you step back and you think and you try to zero in, what's the thing that I'm most concerned about? Because when you do that, then you're also going to have to be open to listening to the other person's story, which may or may not ring true to you, but it's their story nonetheless. And when you do that, then something else happens, which you kind of move into that. If you really want to solve it, instead of just being right, then it becomes me and you versus the problem instead of me versus you. So I've been thinking about this a lot, about how we might, in our own lives, not just back away from our power, which is considerably, but how we might step forward and embrace it. Think, what can I do in the face of ABC? It's probably why I love the Olympics so much. Because the Olympics, um, it's not just that, you know, when you're a runner. I mean, yesterday watching the end of the men's marathon, I actually wept. I mean, it's just... It's so beautiful, and to see the Americans finish eighth and ninth, I mean, it's just like to know what that, a tiny bit of what that takes. But then it's like, back to being an American, don't you feel proud? I'm not talking about the medal count. I'm talking about how diverse this country is. It's so, show me the other country, right? I mean, like, how beautiful and how different and how varied we are. I mean, there's just something about that to celebrate. But then even better, you know, even better than the individual athlete, the parents and the fans and the family. Show me the athlete who doesn't have somebody up there cheering for them, right? Waving for them, kind of. And that kind of reminds you again that we're not individuals. This is all a team sport. We are all in here together. Nobody, nobody makes it on their own. But then when you dig a little further, what do you always find? All these problems in those families. Many illnesses, many injuries, depression, loss of, but people keep coming back. My friend said to me after 
a not so successful conversation with the family member. I keep wondering these days why it is so damn hard to love people, even the people we love. I keep wondering why it is so hard to love even the people we love. That's true. I mean, there's just something about the world we're living in right now. But if we want the world to be different, then we're going to have to act differently, and we're going to have to think differently, right? So we're going to have to, you know, show up and think, not just how can I support this kid, but we're going to have to think about how do we vote? How do we show up in Missouri to raise the minimum wage two bucks, to be sure that we've got, you know, paid sick leave? How do we elect people who are going to extend the child tax credit and extend, expand Medicaid? It's all of this stuff together. So the good news is this, the God who calls us and invites us to care for one another, who fills our lives with compassion, is finally the one who brings us together and makes it possible for us to care. So may we know wisely when it's time to rest in the boat and when it's time to get out. Amen.